Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our 49th video session. We're almost at our 50th. Um, today, we're going to be solving a challenge for Sujata Gautam on um, her idea at CoHub. But before we begin, um, let's start introducing what we do at Impaction and in that video session, and then we'll share who's joined on this call in the first place. Um, so Impaction is ultimately a platform that makes it easier for individuals to get involved and make a difference in their local communities. Um, the purpose of these video sessions is to have face-to-face -face conversations with people and help entrepreneurs and innovators around the world solve challenges and share ideas um, that can help their local communities. Um, so, you know, before we begin, let's introduce who is on this call in the first place um, and who you're watching today. So I'm going to start with myself. I'm Shivani and I'm I'm the CEO of Impaction, um, and I am based here in Chicago, Illinois. So I'm gonna, so Dan, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Daniel, uh, I'm with Impaction as well. I'm doing outreach and community engagement, and I'm based in Chicago. Awesome. Um, Bethany, you wanna go next? Sure, hi, I'm Bethany, um, I'm based in DC. And I currently work as a budget analyst, but I'm very interested in economic development, especially in the field of kind of like environmental preservation and such. So happy to be here. Thanks. Vikram, you wanna go next? Sure. Hi guys, my name is Vikram. I've been working in social impact space for the last eight years, focusing on food security and agriculture, and I have, I'm currently working at World Bank. Awesome. And Juan, you wanna go next? Sure. Hi, my name is Juan Ramos. Uh, I work with agriculture and environmental and climate action and happy to be here. Awesome, thank you. So Jatha, I'm gonna introduce you. So um, like I said, today we're solving challenges for Sujata Gautam, the founder of CoHub. Um, she's a Nepali American uh, graduate student ma pursuing a master in, of arts in social yeah. innovation and sustainability leadership at Edgewood College. CoHub is an online platform that will allow people and organizations to post their available materials and needs for others to find and use. Sujata is passionate about improving the management of waste as a resource, and her graduate social innovation project seeks to explore community-coordinated asset plant mapping as a tool to channel materials flow toward beneficial reuse and recycling. So today, she's asking for um, feedback on her project CoHub and tools that would be useful for her to try as she moves towards regenerative and circular economies. So Sujata, do you want to share more information about yourself, um, about CoHub, and I'll let you share your screen and take it away. Awesome, sounds good Shivani. Um, thank you for the introduction and also great to meet all of you um, here on the Zoom platform. And thanks for the work that you're doing. Um, you mentioned areas that I'm also very interested in um, and support good work happening in those fields. Awesome. Um, so thank you again for being here, everybody. Um, I'm going to be sharing, as Shivani mentioned, uh, what my project CoHub is about. Um, it's titled Using Community Coordinated Asset Databases to Move Towards Circular Economies. I'll start by sharing uh, the challenge that CoHub seeks to address my vision and goals, approach, next steps, and lastly, the input that I currently seek. Let's see if we can select it next, perfect. So I want to begin by sharing with you all the statement that gave birth to the rise of my project. Waste is just resources in the wrong places. That was the statement I had been mulling about in my mind when I asked myself the next question. Well, how can we get these resources in the right places? I began to think about the company that my dad works for, who was about to send hundreds of binders to the landfill because it had transitioned to maintaining its reports to online. Couldn't the company have sought to donate these binders as free school supplies instead? I work at a landfill as an engineering intern, and we see so many items, some perfectly brand new that get sent to us. Why don't connections get made to find these materials a different future? Because let's face it, making these connections take time and effort that many people can't allot. 
Those that do take the time to call us in advance at the landfill often hope to use our services as a last resort for their item. So for example, if someone contacts us about getting rid of a worn mattress, we can connect them to Seven Rivers Recycling, a nearby town here in Madison, which specializes in, recy in mattress recycling. However, our database of connections only goes so far and small recycling businesses often have fluctuating capacities. It is challenging for us as a solid waste management entity to constantly be aware of who is accepting what and the limitations involved around it. There had to be an easier way to connect people and organizations with potential beneficial reuse and recycling options. And that's when I had my aha moment uh, giving birth to the rise of the idea of Coham. So Cohub would be an online platform that will allow people and organizations to post their available materials and needs for others to find and use. The platform goal is to serve as a community coordinated asset database for solid waste management entities, allowing its residents and organizations to co-create pathways to potential beneficial reuse and recycling options. So to explain further, um, on the screen I've mapped, oops, the system I'm talking about, there we go. <laughs> um, I've mapped the system I'm talking about. So the target audience and core beneficiary of COHAB are municipal solid waste management entities who can offer COHAB as a tool for their community. In this example, I look at Madison. This entity is directly impacted by what is written in the green circles. These include Wisconsin waste management laws, which govern how these entities can operate, Madison residents waste, what these entities manage, hauling services that pick up the waste, available drop-off sites that haulers can take the waste to, like landfills and recycling centers, and lastly, a healthy workforce, because without people, none of these jobs can get done. So the surrounding yellow circles that you see on the screen represent the things that indirectly impact my core beneficiary. Many of these are things that may reduce the amount of waste residents put on their curbside for the city to pick up because they offer an alternate reuse, repair, or recycling option for a specific material. Examples include composting businesses, food banks, pantries, repair stores, garage sales, clothing swaps, the list goes on. So Cohub seeks to strengthen the connections between the yellow and the green circles. In the words of systems thinker David Stroh, in order to optimize the whole, we must improve the relationship between the parts. This is what Cohub can offer us. Community members can ask about that mattress. Resale stores like St. Vincent de Paul or Habitat Restore can list materials they accept or currently offer. Offices can post about the binders they need to get off their hands. So in sum, Cohub would allow organizations and people to efficiently create a simple profile, which will be vetted, through email or business phone, post needs along with intended material use, post available materials, and then users will be prompted with suggestions to help them determine what they might have to share as well. View user ratings, reviews, and response rates. List badges designating certification and handing, handling a specific material. Filter searches for material of interest. View the number of exchanges recorded by the platform when users connect and share success or inspiration stories of how various materials were diverted. And then lastly, see a map of where material of interest has gone based on the number of connections documented. Now, one of the things that excites me most about the platform is that it is designing for regenerative culture by connecting unmet needs with spare or new capacities. And then on screen here is a prototype of what it could look like. I want it to be the easier option for everyone to live life described by the blue model that you see on the screen, where we regenerate and restore materials. We can only have well-being for all if we live within the ecological limits of the planet, and using our finite resources in a cyclical rather than linear fashion is critical for this. So Cohub is a tool we can use for living our life in the blue. It is also very much values-based, operating on trust, community and empowerment to get resources in the right places. So this is one of several reasons I believe Cohub is very unique. 
As you can see on the screen, I've compared Cohub to some other platforms where material exchanges are common. None possess all the unique combination of qualities that I believe will make Cohub so valuable. Qualities like the ability to post both needs and availabilities, engage with feedback loops, allow users to be individuals, businesses, community members, governmental entities, and promote circular economies. The beneficiaries of Cohub include municipal solid waste management entities that don't have to constantly serve as the middleman in connecting community members to beneficial reuse and recycling options. People or organizations um, such as processors that do beneficial reuse, repair, or recycling can promote their services on Cohub. Potential processors and manufacturers would also be allowed to build relationships and share knowledge based on the success or insp inspiration stories posted. And then people can see the flow of materials on the platform. So essentially what happens when they get rid of an item to a certain degree, of course. Um, and then the hope is that this transparency will help promote an ethical flow of materials. So beyond facilitating connections that allow users to meet and make potential exchanges across sectors, Co-op showcases success or inspiration stories of how various materials were diverted. These shared stories would allow, would allow and showcase the tools, materials, skills required to beneficially reuse or recycle various materials. User ratings and reviews of the method and, and photographs and diagrams of how these methods evolve. So in this sense, Co-op has the potential to serve as a peer-to-peer, -peer, top quality collaborative network, stimulating market development of hard to recycle materials. So in terms of project development, and I think I went backwards on my slide. No, there we go. <laughs> in terms of project development, um, I'm continuing to build resources to get Co-op off the ground. Capital for any startup is always a big one. I've connected to with a local web developer uh, who can build the minimal viable product for Cohub, which would cost around $1,500, uh, while the full product itself would cost somewhere between seven to 10K. I'm also continuing outreach so I can build a group of pilot users to be among the first to use Cohub and spread the word. Madison Solid Waste Division has expressed interest in this technology, but for it to work, community members, businesses, and nonprofits must engage with it and be willing to provide feedback. So if you have ideas for raising capital, connections that could help advance the project, or want to share other ideas of what tools you think would be useful for us as we try to move towards regenerative or circular economies, I welcome it and can be reached at the following email and cell. And then before I open it up to hear all your thoughts um, and start the discussion, I would just like you to all pause with me for a moment and close your eyes. Imagine a world where beneficial reuse, repair, and recycling was the easy option and the norm. What are we wasting for? Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, here's my references in case anyone wanted to see them. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sujata, and that was a great presentation. So um, I wanted to start off and ask, so it seems like you're in the more of like the idea stage um, of your, you know, your like regenerative platform idea. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us what, you know, the next stage other than outreach and more even, even like the developing capital looks like for you in terms of what types of community members would you like to help support this? Um, yeah, what is the next stage and more of like the tangible next steps look like for you? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now I'm in the process of um, applying to become an LLC so I can get some um, funding, investment funding. And then I'm also working um, with an undergraduate class this upcoming semester who will help me sort of um, build this platform. So I have the local web developer who can build the minimal viable product, but I also need to have a database of materials kind of ready to put on the platform. And this is what these students would be helping me with uh, for this fall semester. Um, they will be helping me collect the stories um, of how people have been able to beneficially reuse or recycle maybe a traditionally harder to recycle materials. And then um, solicit 
the approval of these organizations or businesses or companies that have been able to do it and are willing to share how they did it so that other people can replicate it in their various part of the world or region. So that's sort of where I am, still sort of um, getting, getting the information ready for this platform to launch. And then I, um, as I mentioned, have several people that express interest that they would like to be uh, like in that pilot phase of using it. So that's exciting, but just um, trying to make sure that the pilot phase is going to be as meaningful as possible before I even launch it. And so the better information that I can get on there before that happens, um, the more useful it will be. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Does anyone have any thoughts or any questions they want to ask? Yeah, I'm wondering, um, I mean, you're in the beginning stages now, but are you looking for any specific skill sets as far as supportive staff or volunteers for your projects? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So my background is in engineering, so I'm not very savvy with um, sort of the web development side of things. And so, oh, <laughs> that's great to hear. Um, so I, I am looking for people who are interested in the project and would like to provide input maybe on what, you know, what would be a good, um, you know, user interface. What are some things that I should consider? Because not being familiar with the platform website development field, it's hard to even know what are the right questions to ask a lot of the times. <laughs> um, so I'm slowly beginning to figure out what those are, but even just to have somebody who could, I could piggyback, hey, this web developer told me this, does that make sense? Or like, do you think that's a good idea? Um, would be really nice. I was uh, agreeing with you, not saying I have the skill set. I don't. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no. It's a very niche skill set, it seems. <laughs> if you need support in the terms of interface, user experience, and the interface design, I can probably land you in a consultation with our UX designer. She's a researcher and designer, and she can probably like provide some really useful insights on what you need to focus on for the MVP. Oh, wow, that would be awesome. And could you um, say who this person was again? She's a designer. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I came in late, so I didn't get a chance to introduce myself. Oh, yeah. I'm Saja Osman. I've worked with, with Imbaction before. I'm, I'm kind of running a design studio in Jordan, and we work in communication design. We work with uh, social impact organization and purpose-driven businesses. So probably I can connect you with our UX researcher and designer, the, the team's designer, and she probably can provide some really useful insights. Yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, that would be really great. Thank you, Saja. And nice to meet you. You're welcome. <laughs> you too. You have such great energy. I'm, I'm excited. I came in halfway and I was immediately excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty excited about this idea and just the other good work people are doing in this field. So it's, it's easy for me to have a lot of energy around it, right? <laughs> when you really um, care about something. So. That's great. And I'm always ready to help anything. Well, thank you, Saja. Yeah. Um, I guess in, in the follow-up, we'll probably get one another's contact information. Right. Okay, great. So um, yeah, we could follow up and I can, yeah, connect with you on that. Thank you. Um, no one else has a question. I, I have another one. Um, who are your uh, target partners that you're looking for? Um, not just to well, I guess both to kind of um, uh, try out your 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 methods, um, but also support the efforts of of that happening. So I'm sure there's other, I mean, outside of supportive staff, um, you know, just the communities you're targeting, um, and then who in those communities are you looking to kind of dive uh, into this with? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so I would say like my target. For the users of co-op, I really want to enlist municipal solid waste management entities um, to say, hey, like I, this tool would be really great for you to have in your community in order to make more connections um, and help materials flow and you know divert it from the landfill. Um, and the reason I want to focus on municipal solid waste management entities is they're already connected to a lot of other sort of um, recycling businesses um, and 
people already look towards uh, these entities for waste management guidance. Um, so I feel like tapping into that network um, is definitely the way to go. And then beyond that network, I also want to form my own like sort of relationships with local small businesses who are, you know, trying to use a repurposed material to make something or even like repair stores. I recently visited a repair store in my local town last week um, and was just intrigued at how it, they don't, they seem well connected into the waste management world, even though repair stores um, play a vital role in you know, by repairing things, they prevent them from going to the landfill or, you know, incinerator or wherever else. Um, so, yeah, so kind of building um, groups of people who are in the different sectors, right? So like repair story businesses, some recycling businesses, uh, maybe nonprofit organizations who are always kind of like going through a lot of materials, um, churches. So, yeah, uh, those sorts of entities. Great. Uh, is it, shall I go ahead now? Great. Uh, well, thank you, Sujata, for uh, for the lovely presentation. Uh, I so my understanding of the waste material value chain, and I'm purely speaking from my understanding of how it works in India, is that usually there are four four different segments. So there are people who are generators of scrap and waste material, and then there are collectors who collect it. And then they are taken to the processor, which are usually the municipal corporations. And then there's the last step of disposal of the waste material after whatever has been recycled. Uh, I just wanted to understand where 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 does Cohub fit into this? For uh, my understanding is you are connecting these scrap generators with these scrap processors, right? Yes. So, te so technically, your customers are not only the municipal corporations, but also people who would be listing their products on your on your website. So uh, well, who are your customers to Are they just general households or their institutions? Uh, and how do you have a separate strategy for targeting both kinds of customer segments? Yeah, yeah. And that's an excellent question um, because I feel like different aspects of the platform are going to be uh, beneficial depending on who is using it. Um, so for the people who, um, who get the material and who want to process it um, and then do something with it, I feel like the part of the platform that will be especially useful, besides just maybe using it to find materials, will be the part where they can share stories about how one organization or business was able to avoid a certain byproduct or to use a certain byproduct in their manufacturing process um, to like loop it back into the system. Um, and so, so the shared stories would help um, connect and share strategies around that and tools and best practices. Um, and then for the residents, um, they could use the ability to post the materials they have available and their needs to kind of connect with other people in the area um, to see, you know, and this could be other nonprofits or other households if they have something that they're getting rid of or need. And then they can kind of uh, just connect on there and then meet up to make that exchange. I don't want the platform to actually be like the exchange part, but just like the connection so that they can meet to um, exchange it. And the reason I don't necessarily want it to be like only um, in sectors communicate is because I feel like a lot of a lot of the really great innovative ideas happen when like people from different sectors are talking to each other. So I know like um, one example is uh, one of the nonprofits who I spoke with said they had a bunch of tables and chairs they wanted to get rid of. Um, so they could post something like that on co-op and like households could maybe use some or maybe maybe a business wants to use them, you know, and um, I'll connect that way. Or maybe, uh, yeah, so <laughs> that's just one example. But um, I, I don't know if that answered your question. Um, I, I really see like... Uh, different different sectors each using it um using part of the platform in the way that that makes the most sense or that is the most beneficial for them so for households it might not necessarily be like um l looking at the shared stories or the inspiration stories but maybe for a budding entrepreneur that sees oh like this manufacturer this processor like did something with this material like maybe i should start up my startup and do it in my region because i don't have something like that um, they could always use it as like a startup idea place too. Um, and then for governmental entities, they're the ones who, for example, 
um, a recycling business might say, hey, we accept um, recycled electronics. The governmental entity would make sure that um, they get a badge that they can put on their profile designating that they are indeed certified to take it. Um, so that's kind of where the governmental entity role um, comes in um, just to verify that yes, this person is certified to take this material. So just something I'm thinking about as you're preparing your first steps kind of before launch and you're looking for like success stories and that sort of thing. Another um, aspect to maybe consider is preparing some of the economic arguments for reducing this sort of waste, especially if you're looking at larger organizations who spend a lot of money on disposing of waste because it's actually kind of, it's actually kind of expensive, especially if you're dealing with larger items um, to get those like picked up and taken care of. And so part of your kind of pitch could be the money that's saved by these, like especially I'm thinking like organizations and businesses who do a lot of this stuff frequently, kind of maybe some of the statistics around money that could be saved by doing it this way instead, because not everyone will see or be motivated by the moral imperative, even though we are. Um, a lot of people are motivated by like cost saving. Um, so as you're kind of preparing your stories, I would maybe see what kind of, um, like I know there's people studying that sort of thing. So maybe you could borrow some of their statistics and get an idea of like what that may look like, even if it's just information you include like on the platform uh, or in your presentations. Great. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, go ahead, Juan. Hi, so I think uh, uh, just going back on what was just said about the business case for, uh, for what's potentially available to in terms of costs and revenue, um, I know that a lot of companies are looking for ways to either be involved with circular economy or have some type of that publicity. So uh, I know you say you don't want to get specific on a certain industry, but for example, uh, the electronic waste industry, uh, I think that has huge, huge potential. Uh, so depending on the areas where you're looking to focus, I would say uh, if it's going to be on a global scale, on a national scale, on a state scale, um, specifically look at where um, most of the waste is coming from. And I know that a lot of startups have started specifically with electronic waste. And I don't think the figures have come out on the actual scale of what that looks like. Um, so I think there's huge potential for recycling, um, specifically on the electronic industry. But uh, I think when you say your message uh, and the way you communicate, I think our audience for this specific works really well because we really care about the environment. We care about helping people, but a lot of other people don't. So um, you have to tailor make your message depending on who you're talking to, who's your audience and make it so a lot of people, all they care will really care about is the business case. Yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, definitely have to tweak it. <laughs> I, I truly it. agree here. Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, I agree. And I think what both Bethany, Bethany and Juan's case, I think, you have a vision and that's vision, that vision is very wide and it works for the long run. But I think for the first few steps, you need to focus and narrow down your audience. Think of who your early adopters would be, who you think are the ideal people who would actually jump onto this, because these are the people you need to cater to in the MVP case. Otherwise, if you're trying to work for everyone, organizations and households, government entities, all at the same time, you will need either like a huge budget to push this everywhere, or you'll need to be kind of a very essential type of business model or product. So I think for where you're pushing for greener ways to handle things and 
let's call it a niche kind of market, maybe you need to figure out who your early adopters are and how you can kind of access these people to make sure that your MVP actually gives you good results. Yeah, and I have to echo that, um, Saja or Sujata. Um, in the in the chat, I added what Saja was referring to was the innovation adaption, adoption curve, and in this way, you'll be able to find out who your innovator and your who your early adopters are, and when you're at this stage of the business, really hone in on who those can be. Because I'm hearing that your um, both a B2B and a B2C market or B2B and B2C type of business, but really hone in on who are going to be the people that latch onto this idea. Maybe it starts at the government side, or maybe you need the, um, the consumers to attract the government to sign on to, you know, what you're proposing. So really just um, hone in on that idea. And the best way to do that is to talk to as many people as possible and see it, how the data aligns and what patterns you see from what they're saying. It's a really good point. Um, a quick point or a suggestion is that I'm not sure if you're looking at the problem from the behavioral change lens as well, because most of the social problems you are actually uh, uh, prompting people to change a certain behavior and switch on to a new behavior. So you probably have to look at it from the lens of what kind of incentives you are creating. They need not be financial incentives. Well, of course, as Bethany mentioned, an economic uh, incentive is a great one, but look at the other incentives that would help you make uh, that behavioral change where people uh, come to your model or to your website and then uh, adopt the new process. So like in India or in other parts of the world, uh, uh, in recycling and in uh, uh, waste management, there's been a lot of behavioral change models that have been tried. Uh, so you probably want to look at uh, the ones probably which fit into your context and the people you're trying to work with. Mm -hmm. One other thing on the note of like recycling, we've gotten to this weird place, especially in the US where it's like becoming it's no longer cost effective to recycle um, because China used to buy all of our recycling and now they're not anymore. Um, so another kind of perspective to look at is how is focusing more on like the reduce and the reuse part of that whole little triangle, which actually come before recycle, but we got very focused on recycling in America um, because people feel like powerful that they can throw something in the recycling and they're like, I did my part, but um, focusing more on that like reusing like that's kind of the part of the little triangle that you're focused on with this so really thinking about um, maybe mark like on the consumer side how to market that that aspect in particular um, because people aren't really that aware of the expense behind recycling um, and you're kind of trying to cut that middleman out by doing this which is amazing because we definitely need more um, on the reuse side but just kind of another part to think about in your argument about how recycling is actually like it's becoming less and less cost effective so this will like reduce some of that that um, waste in terms of money as well shall i give my yeah hello everyone and hi sujata thank you for your wonderful presentation um, actually, looking towards the presentation, I also missed some parts because you're tripling of electricity. I'm facing that problem. So I, I feel that your presentation is very vague and you want to do lots of things, but that is not really possible right now. So I really um, support what Juan said is that if you want to do recycling, then that electronic um, e-cycle waste or that is more niche part, which uh, most of the peoples have left and it's, it's not untouched part. So other things you can find many companies that are doing upcycling and you can find many companies who are generating revenues and so that's so new you need to develop a concrete business plan and you need to narrow down as Bethany said and Vikram also said that. And you also need to focus on which area you have to focus and if you want then I can give the suggestion of the companies, the Nepalese company who are always working, like they 
there are two companies that are working in in the recycling of the waste one is the kalicc.com which means an empty bottle that is glass they they only recycle glass and another is dopo recyclers which manages like the menstruation waste and e waste and so on so they can do all of the things but when you start to do the things then it becomes very tedious and as bethany says that now it is not cost effective it may seem very good topic and it it may seems that it is very impactful but now it has come to the people mindset that uh, it's better to buy things and throw down than to recycle so it's become really really hard so there are a lot of lot of homework to do but i appreciate your work and i wish you best of luck Awesome. Thank you for your comments. That's really good. And I, I definitely want to look into Kali CC. I've not heard of that one. I'd heard of Dilco Recyclers. Um, but yeah, definitely some good things to think about. And I, I, I definitely do see how I sort of have this like broad <laughs> sort of overview and reach. Um, but to narrow it down as much as possible would probably be best, especially for this MVP part of it. Um, so yeah, thank you. Would your MVP be an app or is, would it just be a website? Just curious. Yeah, so it would be, um, it would be one of those, I forgot what the name of it is called, but it's like a website, but it will show okay on the phone. It will be designed so that it, you can function it, use it on the phone in, in, in an app-like manner, but it, it wouldn't be distorted. Um, I had a question. Um, how are you looking ultimately to uh, track your impact or have other people track the implant uh, the impact when they implement your ideas and all that? So that's sort of where the um, responses, review, and rating aspect of it come in through the platform. So I can see um, how many people connected because when you connect it, it will record that. Um, and then as far as engagement goes, the amount of reviews that people are giving other people and the ratings of like working with them or getting their material is another way of tracking the impact. And then just the stories that I'm able to collect from the people who are using it um, or benefited from the platform um, because there will be like a stories feature. Um, so those are just some ways. So I would say definitely it would be, it's more like qualitatively tracking than quantitatively. Um, but I feel like the, the qualitative part of it is more of the, uh, like it's easier to share. It's the, it's the part that people connect with more, like the stories, right? Like the cool things people were able to do with the material or, um, or what they were able to get because they met somebody like on Koha that had something that they were really looking for. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, definitely. The I, I would say the qualitative is, is the engaging part, right? Mm -hmm. um, but moving forward, as you establish your base and the partnerships, you're going to have to switch to um, quantitative because that's where the investors and, um, you know, if you're able to apply for grants and everything like that, they all require that. So um, it's kind of like mo mo metrics equals money as far as investors and stuff like that they want to see how much how many tons of waste you know how many people are involved how fast is this expanding um you know, there's going to be a lot of those elements um that need to be factored in but until you have all the support to track all that yeah definitely the qualitative the relationships are what's going to draw people in. so something to keep in mind um i don't have all the answers i've worked with a lot of different organizations that do a lot of different um, case studies um, and things like that, that all are numbers based. Um, but ultimately in all realms that I've been a part of, the relationship base is the most important. So I'm glad you're starting there. Yeah, and thanks for highlighting. You're right, I like that metrics is money. <laughs> That's a good way of remembering, yeah. I, I tend to be more story oriented and qualitative oriented, so it's a good reminder that I also need to be able to speak other people's languages who speak more of that money metric. I mean, there are a lot of different hats that you can wear with this. Um, that's 
that it's good to start with you know an idea that you've seen that is a clear need in your community i do have to piggyback off of what vikram said with behavioral change because and this kind of correlates to what bethany was saying about how people think that recycling is you know it's a great thing that they can do and they don't put much thought into it and they chuck a bottle into a trash can and think that's enough right so um I think your mission can very much align with behavioral change. What do you want to see in people 10, 20 years from now as a result of your platform? And then you can start going backwards from there and then trickle it down to your metrics and what are the quantitative ways you would be able to plan for the future. Um, that's where the mission is what will get people. Your mission can't be you know, I'm a platform that connects people. No, what do you want to see at the end of what you do? What does success look like for you? Um, how can you bring that success to people in your community? And it has to come from behavioral change if you're starting with a social mission, for sure. And I think that Juan has an idea as well. Yeah, so just going off of what Shivani was saying, and then um, I think if you haven't already created your theory of change, uh, I think that'll be really helpful because as Shivani was saying, like, what do you want to do at the end? Like, what does your end goal look like? And I think your theory of change and I can either send Shivani and she can send you some documents about a theory of change because if you're looking for investment long-term, the storytelling is very important. You have to back it up with numbers, but I think a theory of change combining both creates a really powerful impact, especially with impact investors who could potentially be looking to invest in, in your organization. So uh, I think a theory of change will really clarify for you and for other people what those steps will look like. And it also help you clarify either if you have to pivot, either if you have to change certain things to get to your end goal. Yeah, those are some really good points. I'm making so many notes. <laughs> this is so helpful. Um, wow, lots of really good things to mull over. On the note of theory of change, that's exactly where my brain went as well. But what I was going to say is there are plenty of people who work in like the impact management space, myself included, who like work pro bono and kind of help you sort out some of those details and just start to think about the broader frame. And then that's what helps you work backward to some of your, of your um, you know, more quantitative measurements and indicators. And I think that the idea of like measuring kind of what Daniel was saying, like tons of waste that was saved will go along very easily with like money saved. And that's where like you are going to have some of those like multi-layered arguments that are happening for different audiences. Um, and in general, like obviously it's good to think about that kind of stuff ahead of time, even if you're not ready to start measuring yet, but just something to keep in mind. I mean, on an individual basis, whoever is contributing to this platform, people can kind of keep track of like what they, you know, how they connected with other people and what they gave them. And you can kind of predict like how much things weigh and thus how much is saved. Um, and if you get an idea kind of based on locality of how much it normally costs to like dispose of that waste, you should be able to do some like decent estimating without having to like measure very, very specifically um, kind of what you're saving from the landfill. There's plenty of methods to do that that don't require a lot of like really in-depth math if that makes you a little bit nervous. But the um, focusing on qualitative first, I think is a great idea too, because especially when you're dealing with like a local environment, people are gonna hear about this through word of mouth. Um, and I'm thinking about Madison specifically, uh, the people that are like very environmentally focused in Madison all know each other and they all talk to each other and they're gonna be like, I found this great thing, I'm so excited. And like, that's how you're gonna get some of that, those original, those first implementers who are like pumped and like ready to kind of go out of their way to try things. Um, and yeah, those have to be your sort of early, early innovators and they, they do all talk to each other. So that's going to help you with some of that, um, that like first stage implementation as well. And you'll know that they're early adopters if they do refer by word of mouth, you won't have to spend a dollar on marketing. They will be, and you don't even need like hundred of pe hundred people to be your early adopters. Maybe it just depends on your metrics internally, but even if you get up to 20 people, we're able to share this across 
I don't know, whatever family and friends that they have, that might be enough for you. You just have to determine like what the KPI is and what goal you need. And if they're doing it organically, ask them why they are. Always ask why. What is a KPI? Sorry, key performance indicator. Oh. So it's like a way to measure your goals and how you're going to be tracking quarter to quarter, year to year, um, your success metrics at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, such good ideas. <laughs> so what are you thinking? What are you feeling at this portion? Yeah, I have a lot of ideas. Yeah, a lot. Um, a lot more like I think uh, refining and also beefing up to do and like with the different parts of the project. Um, some of which I think that the undergraduate students who want to help me work on this can also gain experience helping me do um, as like a team. Um, so yeah, this is really helpful. Um, I'm trying to, let's see. Um, what are your thoughts on connecting with um, other other recycling uh, organizations or businesses that might be in the same field um, and seeing if they like would want to incorporate like this platform already on something that they're doing? Because that was the other other thought that came to mind is, you know, there are organizations that, you know, are working on trying to help advance circular economies and they're doing their own things. But I also like, part of me doesn't want to recreate the wheel. So if I can like spearhead an initiative or a part of whatever they're already doing, but make this, the thing that I spearhead co-hub is ask, um, that is also a route I could go rather than trying to just like do it all like as my own LLC. Um, so that also, crossed my mind and I'm just trying to figure out like uh you know what the benefits of either or would be or if you if anybody had any thoughts about that um because I always go back to like I don't want to reinvent the wheel and like start from scratch and see if I could work with somebody else that's already you know making headway but if they're not quite at this point yet could I help them get to a co-op point so I'm up for anyone asking, I mean, anyone's feedback and I'll go last. Bethany, go for it. I think oh, good. I mean, you'll probably just notice a lot of vigorous nodding. We're all like, yes, let's collaborate. There are like a million organizations doing a million different things and there's a lot of overlap and not a lot of communication. That's like kind of what impaction is, right? Exactly. Like to get everyone in the same room yeah. um, and get the people working on similar projects or just similar goals. Like everyone has like a slightly niche way of approaching a problem and like you're definitely doing something that's a little bit different than what other people are doing or that's like the goal. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, there are people out there who are working on similar projects and you should absolutely collaborate with them. Not everyone will want to collaborate with you. So like leave those people out of it. Um, But the people who are really excited about collaborating, like, yeah, absolutely. There's no reason to redo stuff that's already being done. So just kind of see where your puzzle piece fits in like the broader puzzle. And that may be different in different spaces too, right? Because some Mm -hmm. or some like local organizations will have like their little spot that they live in. And you'll fit on one side or the other of that. And then some places will have nothing. And so you may have to do some of that reinvention. But then you have those organizations you've already collaborated with who you can you can see what's working really well for them and see how you can kind of replicate some of that elsewhere. So yeah, all those, those are great resources. And most, especially I think in the environmental field, people are like very ready to collaborate because this is such a huge problem and there's no way we're going to solve it just like one organization at a time. People are very aware of that. Yeah, I think the challenging part too is you don't know like what potential collaborations might happen. So for example, I just like recently discovered this one organization that's doing a lot of the work that I would like. Some of it is like what I wanted co-op to do, some of it isn't. And um, I like reached out to them and hoping to hear back. But my thought was, you know, what if they do want to collaborate and then that will kind of change what I end up doing right on my end with this. Um, But then if they don't or aren't, you know, for whatever reason, like, what, what would I do then? Like, would I still feel as, like, 
would I just try to build the part of co-op that they're not doing? <laughs> you know, so I'm trying to like navigate some of that too right now. Yeah. And that's going to be stuff you have to just sort of decide as those situations come about. Um, but you may like, as you're developing this, your, your niche may change a little bit based on what's available. And like I said, it's going to be different in different places. So like what one city needs versus a different city is going to just be different. Um, and I think you should build what you imagined and then just sort of see as you flesh out some of these collaborative spaces, like what is more useful to different um, like pockets of people and organizations. That would be my thought at least prepare for like the wide version. And then if you need to narrow that for different spaces, then you can narrow it. Yeah, um, that's very true. I think the tricky thing with that too is the more people I talk to, they get excited about me developing one part of CoHub that would be really beneficial to them. And then they'll really want to help me with that one part, but I'm like, wait, <laughs> there's like, <laughs> that might make it go a different direction. And then it's, you're, then you have to go back to like, okay, what am I actually like, what is my, one purpose because um yeah it's hard I think a part of me wants to be able to fill everyone's needs too which I can't do that I have to focus so the theory of change will help you with this yes yeah I because think you can just ask yourself helpful. the question does this yeah. fit with my mission and my theory of change like is this helping me measure like get hit these specific indicators whatever they whatever you decide they are this will help a lot with some of those questions yeah. I'm definitely going to look up those links that yep. <laughs> you dropped. Thank you. Yeah, I do. Need Another to thing I can think of that would help. There's something we do when we're shaping a brand and just the brand's presence and strategy. And usually you go with like the brand's purpose and the positioning. And the positioning takes you understanding what's out there, what's the landscape that you're going to function in. And once you have a good understanding of what's out there, you consider wh where you want to position Koha. So when you have a clear positioning and a clear purpose and you're sure everything aligns and everything works towards the same purpose, the same change you're aiming for and the impact, it's easier to consider collaborations that serve the brand purpose and easier to consider also what parts to focus on right now from the product and what parts to delay a little and how you're going to build this continuous plan because you have a clear vision of where you're positioning yourself and how you're going to sell this because regardless if it's for profit or non-profit, you're always selling an idea or a concept or a new change into people's routines. So you, you yeah. want to know how, what you're selling and where you're selling it to whom. Mm -hmm. That is such a good point. Yeah. I yeah. hate to do this. I hate to do this, but we have to wrap up. <laughs> time. But you guys, this was just an amazing session. Um, thank you, Sujata. Thank you to everyone on this call. Um, as Sujata, I hope, you know, we've, we may have given too many ideas for you to consider. This was so good, no. <laughs> this was so, so needed for me because I was coming to a point where I was like, okay, I need to, like, really make sure I have something more solid I can, like, build. Yeah, and we're here. I mean, but, I mean, we're, like, the impaction community in general is just here. So, yeah, like, just keep keep at it, and we can also, you know, host another session to see um, if you need like an additional, like in a few months, just if you re revisit or pivot in any way, it would be really cool to see, you know, how you progress over time and we can track it for sure. So just yeah. let us know and we can stay in touch. Um, and if you guys have any additional ideas, I just want to share my screen really quickly. Um, we can, uh, Jatha has posted on our idea forum. Um, if you guys have any other ideas, um, about her particular challenge, um, go for it. We'll make, make sure, you know, you can post and comment on it. Um, if you have any links to share, feel free to do it on here. Um, so Jatha, we'll keep track of this thread and we'll make sure that you keep track of it as well. And we will also send out like a follow-up email um, with everyone's information so you guys can connect and whatnot. But I do want to respect everyone's time. Thank you for everyone who's joined all around the world. Sujata, congrats on your mission. Keep pushing. Um, and we will be here, you know, for support. So thank you guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>